It's been around two weeks since I finished Far Cry 5 for the first time. My thoughts have had a chance to settle and the opportunity to read up on other players' experiences has given me the breathing space I needed to wonder if I'd overreacted. The series is hardly one that I'm an avid fan of. I've never played the first game and although I own the second game it has been played for maybe half an hour at most. Like many, my first experience with the series was with Far Cry 3, a refreshing, superbly written, paced and acted game for the most part that was, at the time, something new and exciting. Sure, it set the stage for the hallmarks of traditional Ubisoft gameplay these days, climbing towers to clear parts of the map, 10,000 collectibles scattered across the place, and the inundation of side quests and glassy-eyed NPCs walking in front of you when you're trying to have a conversation. Back when I played it, I was fresh-faced out of Skyrim and looking for something new and different to sate the urge for an intelligent shooter. Far Cry 4 is often touted as being the third game but in the snow, and I would agree for the most part, although it lacked the intrigue of a drug fueled and desperate fight for survival and its protagonist was about as interesting as watching paint dry, it was still a fun game and I enjoyed it enough that I went back recently to platinum it. What the fourth game had going for it more than anything was an outstanding performance by the eminent Troy Baker. Pagan Min was both a terrible and fantastic villain, absurdly likeable and witty. Every time he was on screen, or prattling on the radio, he was a golden gem in a slightly ragged rough. And though the game wasn't perfect, its cast of good guys and bad guys did a reasonable job of showing how muddy the moral waters can be, and how easy it is to fall prey to a power fantasy. Early on in Far Cry 5, the game makes fun of its predecessors, proudly proclaiming that the player doesn't need to worry, it won't be climbing any towers in this game. True to its word, there is no climbing of anything unless the player expressly wants to. The map seems to be roughly the same size as the previous games and uncovers as you explore it and locate places of interest, rather than staring beady-eyed from the top of a swaying tower every five minutes. The removal of what is, at this point, an almost essential Ubisoft trope is a blessing in a thin disguise, but it doesn't distract from the game's other, more glaring missteps. This time around you play a male or female law enforcement officer. Nameless, typically referred to as Deputy or Rook, your chosen caricature is entirely voiceless other than the odd few grunts of pain. My initial reaction to this was fantastic, they responded to the criticisms of AJ's lack of personality and drive by giving your character no personality at all. And this was a feeling that never really went away. Like many voiceless protagonists, the idea is to let the player project their own motivations onto the character. And the problem with this is that if the player doesn't understand their motivations or isn't particularly engaged with the game to begin with, a protagonist with no name, voice or story of their own is very difficult to feel attached to. It's not that it gets in the way of the core of Far Cry, namely driving around blowing things up and shooting at hairy bare-chested men, but it seems a strange narrative decision as players typically have a degree of freedom in games where the protagonist is silent. Hell, in the third game, Jason could choose to stay on the island and AJ could choose to give Pagan the benefit of the doubt right at the start of the game. Other than a brief moment where you can indeed turn around and walk away and basically never play the game, there's no real narrative freedom for the player here. So what was the purpose of removing the agency of the character? Mechanically, the game is exactly what you would expect. It's a first-person shooter in which climbing, crouching, sprinting and driving are the heart of where you go and what you decide to do. The game controls reasonably well and the driving mechanics are easily the tightest they've ever been. In comparison to previous entries, the weapon selection seems a little lacklustre. I collected the guns I would use for the rest of the game in the first hour or so and, barring an occasional jaunt to the shop to get a rocket launcher, I rarely swapped my kit. The bow is back, and just as enjoyable as always, there's a satisfying weight to shots and there's still that primal satisfaction of getting a headshot from 100 metres away. Once you settle on a loadout you like, there's no real reason to try other guns. You can pick them up to have them automatically added to your arsenal, then throw them away again, but all this really does is make you waste 10 seconds staring at your feet like a particularly trigger-happy shoegazer. Somewhat appropriately, there's also a clothing system, and the game has wanted posters slapped all over the place that show what your character looks like at any moment in time. How exactly the crazy cultists manage to get an up-to-date photograph of you every time you change your boots or the colour of your sunglasses, God only knows, but it was a quirky little touch at the very least. Other returning features include the perk system, although it has been greatly reduced in comparison to previous entries. Perks are broken down into five categories survivalist for your health upgrades, movement upgrades and so on, 
Renegade, which typically relates to methods of transport and sabotage, Assassin, which improves your stealth and traversal capabilities, Prepper, which unlocks additional holsters and ammo bags, and Leader, which lowers the respawn time for companions. As an aside, there are 9 companions in this game, 3 per region, and whilst I understand the benefits of having a buddy around to get in the way of your bullets, my playstyle was very much a lone wolf archetype and I found little use for the companions for the most part. This is down to personal preference and has very little impact on the game overall. Regardless, the decision to intertwine the crafting with the perks was a sensible decision in theory, trimming away some of the fat from previous entries. Although the removal of crafting with the exception of your consumables is a shame since the hunting challenges were some of the more engaging side quests in previous games, evil satanic honey badgers notwithstanding. The way the game plays is, for the most part, pretty solid, but at this point in the Ubisoft franchise saga I'd be surprised if it wasn't. There are still some little niggles I have that I'm uncertain about the nature of, though. The fact that stealth feels very hit and miss, for starters. On occasion I would sneak my way into a compound, take down one man who was on a roof away from the prying eyes of others, and, as if by magic, every single enemy knew where I was and did that very Outlast 2 thing of, we're not supposed to know where you are, but we're going to walk right up to you anyway. This happened at almost every compound throughout the entire game and I have no idea what it was that caused this. The game's AI in general is a bit wonky in places, at times allowing you to glide right past them without a care in the world and at other times spotting you from 30,000 feet away behind a brick wall, a field, a cow and a post box. Their bullets also had, at times, an extraordinary ability to phase straight through blockades, making avoiding damage extremely difficult, and although health now fully regenerates over time, the decision to remove the healing mechanic where you could restore a bar or two of your health without needing a medkit meant that most of my deaths were caused by an enemy half a mile away, bending a bullet into the trench I was trying desperately to melt into. The game is also incredibly glitchy, so much so, in fact, that at times I wondered if I'd accidentally stumbled into Skyrim. Rather than sit and list everything that happened to me though, here's a quick montage of my favourites. Anyway, the biggest talking point of Far Cry 5 is, of course, the story. I'm not going to bother going into any depth on the political shitstorm that circulated the internet after the first details of the game's setting and content emerged, but as a non-American who has watched that one Louis Thoreau documentary, I was pretty curious to see how Ubisoft would tackle such a heavily debated rich topic. The answer, as it turned out, was not very well at all. Far Cry 5's setting is gorgeous, rampaging through the countryside has never looked or felt more enthralling, but the game suffers heavily for the way its story is told to you and there is no more disservice to what could have been a fascinating delve into the human psyche than the way it portrays its four main villains, Joseph, John, Faith and Jacob Seed. Each of them has their own region, and the purpose of the game is to create enough destruction and gather enough support from the locals to oust each of them from their position of power. You achieve this through completing, what else, quests that are, to be fair, varied and almost equally as enjoyable as one another. Each quest you complete increases the resistance meter, and at three points per region the area's big bad will have you kidnapped and brought to them for a bit of chastising before you carry on with your murder and your mayhem and what have you. As a side note, the kidnappings that occur in each region are incredibly invasive, they can and will happen anywhere and cannot be prevented, only delayed. I had several instances where I'd be standing in an outpost amongst friendly NPCs when I would suddenly be hit by an arrow and carted off by the enemy, or my favourite moments being kidnapped from a moving car. This is a gimmick I could have lived with if it had only happened in the region where it made the most sense, Jacob's region, of which I'll say no more for spoiler purposes. But by the second time it happened in the second region I wandered into, it was becoming far more tedious than intriguing. 
These are the only times that the main plot is actually advanced and you have any interaction with the villains beyond the moment of their death. And these quests stand as a stark contrast to the rest of the bullet and bomb riddle game. As I would imagine everyone knows by now, Far Cry 5 deals with a crazy cult called Eden's Gate, led by a dapper gentleman called Joseph Seed, who leads his flock in the isolation of rural Montana. You and your companions drop in via chopper and attempt to arrest Joseph, only for your helicopter to be shot down and your companions kidnapped. The majority of the game is centred around ousting Eden's Gate from Montana, rescuing your comrades and building a resistance to their theocracy, all whilst doing your best to avoid Joseph's psychopathic diatribe. For all Far Cry 5 thinks it has to say, it never quite goes far enough, and the biggest reason for this, I suspect, is that Ubisoft were too worried about alienating a huge number of people. After all, religion is a big deal in the US from what I've been told. It wouldn't do well to have a company whose other big franchise proudly proclaims it was made by people of various ethnicities, religions, etc. Turn around and lambast the religious, even if they are exclusively singling out the particularly wacky segments. As a result, the game treads a very, very thick line, occasionally dipping a toe into the side of political discourse, but primarily choosing to just throw the player into the explosive violence side of things. And because of this, the game has nothing to say. It doesn't know what its message is, it doesn't know what it's trying to tell people. Really, it just wants the player to have fun, and I can respect that in a way. But the setting, the story, and the characters are at extreme odds with each other, and the way they clash has a negative effect on the way the game ultimately pans out. Spoiler warning, if you have not completed the game, please skip to the annotated timestamp. That's your final warning, 3 to one This is no more evident than the game's endings. I'll be blunt, the endings are appalling. I have not felt so cheated by a game's ending in a very long time, and certainly never in an open world game of this calibre. After spending 50 plus hours building up a grand resistance of likely hundreds upon hundreds of locals, ousting Eden's Gate and killing three of its four leaders, I arrived at Joseph Seed's compound in an attack helicopter, which was promptly teleported away as the very friends I had just spent hours rescuing turned up handcuffed yet again at the mercy of some other NPCs whom I had previously helped and or rescued, who were now brainwashed with drugs. I was given the choice of walking away or doing the sensible thing and putting a stop to Seed's idiotic madness. No matter what you do, everyone dies. In the first of the main two endings, you choose to walk away, get into a car and leave Seed to his devices. As you're leaving, the sheriff turns on the radio and the song that Jacob Seed conditioned you to kill to starts to play. It puts the deputy in a trance and the game strongly indicates that he will slaughter everyone, meaning your 50 hours of gameplay achieved literally nothing. In the second ending, you have a showdown with Joseph. Handcuff him and drive away in a car whilst a nuclear fucking explosion cheerfully erupts in the background. As you're driving away with full agency, I might add, which will be important in a moment, you turn off the road, hit a tree, and black out. Everyone except you and Joseph die. Joseph drags you into a nearby bunker, cuffs you to a bed, and proudly proclaims that you will be his new family now, achieving nothing. Cut to black. Now, I like downer endings. I love a tragic and miserable tale as much as the next sadist, but in other games of that nature, other films and other novels, the ending feels earned. The issue is that Far Cry 5 doesn't earn its endings, either of them, and it is a little short of a slap in the face of a player when the game takes the time you spent, pisses it all down a drain and says, hey, wasn't that fun? You know what would have alleviated this a little bit for me? That second ending, the one that I chose the first time, have it branch off into two paths. Since you have agency during the driving section, why not have made it so that failing to escape or crashing caused the ending where you get locked up by Joseph? whereas successfully navigating the collapse of the forest would reward you with bringing the lunatic to justice. Regardless, if it weren't for the fact that the game seems utterly determined to boil your hours and hours of hard work down to an ending where everything you did meant nothing, I'd be much less critical of this game. As it stands, with the knowledge that all I did was pointless, I've got no desire whatsoever to replay this game. In summary, the core gameplay is great fun, even if it is glitchy, and though the main quests sometimes feel a little tacked on, they tend to embellish the best parts of the game, whilst the final hour only highlights the worst. If you're looking for something to blow off a little steam to, or if you're a fan of the previous games, I would recommend Far Cry 5. 
It's different enough to certainly warrant a shot, and the setting, variety of missions and ability to have a bear follow you around if you fancy it compound the frantic, fun or ninja-like gameplay the series has become known for. Just be sure to put off actually ending the game for as long as possible. Hello everyone and welcome to the ending segment where I ramble at you for a little bit about how happy I am that you've watched my video. If you like what I do and you'd like to see more, please consider clicking the subscribe button. If you agree and or disagree with my opinion, please pop a comment in the comments box below and I will do my best to get back to you. I try and respond to everybody, um, it's not always timely, I will admit that, but I do try and get back to everybody who comments on my videos and I really appreciate it, thank you very much. If you've got any suggestions for games you think I should play and review, please do let me know. I'm always open for video suggestions. Finally, with regards to an uploading schedule. At the moment I am working on the second of my big projects, one of the early promises I made in my Shape of Things to Come video earlier in the year. It is taking a lot of time, um, the script needs several revisions, but I am working on it. I have about 10 minutes done and I'm expecting it to be about 40 minutes long, like the Deus Ex video. If you want any updates on that, or updates on my channel, or if you want to see me ramble, please consider following me on Twitter, at trusty underscore jack. You can find the handle in my description below. Otherwise, thank you very much for watching, and have yourself a wonderful day.